Okay, so now <coughs> um, <coughs> so we talked about it. So we have the platform of the manipulator, and then we always talk about something called the pose of an object in 3D. Okay. So you would have the x, y, z coordinates, right, which describe the position on top, and then you describe it using roll, pitch, and yaw angles. Okay. Now, if you go back on your dynamics and your Euler angles, you know that roll, pitch, and yaw are not unique. It assumes that you are doing a roll and a pitch and then a yaw. Okay, so the sequence is important. So you cannot arbitrarily, so there are many ways. So if you know that manipulate is initially in this kind of position and then after some time it's moved to this position, it is not necessary that you always roll by this amount and then you pitch by this amount and then you yaw by this amount to get to this position. That sequence is not unique. You could always go the other way around. You could do a yaw first, but then your angles will change, right? And so there are, I think, three Euler notations for it, you know, Euler system one, two, three. Remember anything of this? No, must have been done. Shames, Miriam. Hmm? No? Professor Dumir's notes. No? You didn't do mechanics? Which book? Huh? You didn't refer to Shames. That's a shame. <laughs> So please look up Euler angles in Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, it's there. It's there. It's there in Shames' book. It's there in Miriam. So th there are many options. Okay, so but we will assume that it's roll first, and then we have the pitch and the yaw in this case. Now, if you <coughs> look here, so I have repetitions, right? So I'm talking generally about these parameters: x, y, z, roll, pitch, and yaw. Now I give a command, a pose command that I really want x now to become this desired value. So I'm calling it xd, x desired, similarly y desired, and then z desired. Similarly, there is a desired roll value, a pitch value, and a yaw value. Okay. Now that's my wish list. I do inverse kinematics and I compute that what should be the desired leg lengths. Okay, leg one desired, leg two desired, leg three. So I've just stacked this. I've kept six here because I have six here. So these are not one is to one mapping. So if I change the x value, I will change perhaps all the leg values. If I don't change anything else in this uh, set. Okay. So similarly, there is you know so you get a set of desired leg values. Now here is what will happen. So I'm at this instant, I'm at a particular position with a certain set of leg values or leg lengths. Next I say I wish I were in this configuration. You wish will, so you say okay fine, I wish I was in this configuration. So I said okay, I wish the legs were in this length, but all your wishes are not fulfilled. Right? Why are they not fulfilled? Condition may not satisfy both of them. <laughs> well, yes, that's a possibility that you know if you want it to be so short and your actuator has a minimum length, it will not go down. If you want it to be so long, actuator has a maximum length, it will not become more than that. There are usually when you have these kind of linear actuators, you have hard stops at the end. If you have a sense sense it goes beyond this, you stop it. Okay, so you have all these issues. Even if you don't have these issues. There is position error, actuator, torque limitation, speed limitation, force limitations, everything. So, at any time you will not get this, you will get something which is the actual link length. Okay. And corresponding to the actual link length, you can do a forward kinematics and you can find out what is the actual pose of the platform. So this is important to understand that if you are looking at a snapshot of the manipulator at some time in its run, it is not at the desired position. 
if you take a random snapshot, there is a desired position, it will eventually get there or within a small error bound of that place, right? But at this instant, when you take the snapshot, it may not be at the desired position. So the leg lengths are not what you desire it to be and the actual length is something and the actual pose is something else. Okay, so this becomes um, fairly, uh, so we have to work through this. Now this is also true of serial manipulators except I have not spent so much time in detailing that because there are more books written on that. So, <coughs> so you have limitations of force, limiting velocity, uh, you can't jump to a desired position instantaneously. Uh, generally, an error in the platform pose. Now, what you typically do for the LEA robot, which is a high precision robot, but these computations are not very difficult. As I will show you on Friday, you can write a pretty much a small Excel sheet and you can do most of the graphics in, or well, you could do it in MATLAB also. And just to demonstrate that uh, the material I'm, te I'm teaching is actually not that difficult to implement. You can implement it fairly easily. Yeah. There's just this barrier which stops you from implementing it, so we'll see. So you can pretty much calculate the inverse kinematics at one kilohertz, which is a thousand times a second using modern processors. There is absolutely no problem. Okay, just like that. It doesn't take any time. Then what you do is so once you can calculating the inverse kinematics, internally you interpolate it at 20 kilohertz. So what you'll typically have, you'll have a microcontroller, which is uh, controlling the actuator position in a closed loop. Now that runs at 20 kilohertz, so interpolate. So if you say you move over 20 millimeters, right, over um, one microsecond, usually you split it up into a motion which is some interpolated value in the intermediate region is okay move over a millimeter every 120th of a microsecond and then you track that. So interpolation through Jacobian control or whatever the means that you do. And then you update the direct kinematics typically about 5 millisecond intervals. So which is for 5, for, so for 5 inverse kinematic calculation you do 1 direct kinematics just to make sure the platform is in the right place. So things are not going out of bound and then if you want to display it using a on the controller figure and then you can see whether things are okay and just to check. So th this is the numbers for the earlier thing which you can find on the net, so lots of places where you can find it. Now, <clears throat> so that's one thing. The second thing is there's this concept of homing, I mean the platform needs to have a home, somewhere which you call platform x, y, z, zero, the right orientation, everything is typically roll pitch or going to zero. So when you do this, you would specify, you, you want to specify many of these parameters, what is the homing velocity, what's the limit of it. You suppose you say that platform, okay, you go to a home position. So you just don't want it to go very fast, even though a manipulator can move very fast because I mean, there might be something on top of it. It might be, in, so there are, you need to specify homing velocities, current limit during homing. Otherwise, you'll burn <coughs> some actuators or some controller elements. <coughs> Position error thresholds. What is your error? Operation velocity of pitch and pitch on roll angles. Operational acceleration of pitch roll and your, your angles and jerk. So what is the rate at which you start the motion? So you don't start with finite acceleration. So, so you specify the jerk also. Many derivatives beyond that, we can't feel them apparently. So similarly, you have these parameters on the velocity acceleration and linear jerk. What is the minimum height that you want in the, which is allowed in the z direction which you can go to and then specify minimum length of the actuator so that if there's a violation you can take care of it. So it's rather you do that in software, keep, keep care of all these parameters in your software rather than letting the actuators hit a hard stop, okay. 
that's preferred. Then everything in software control, you don't have to open up the thing and mess around with it. So now, <coughs> so what we are talking about is, we will just say alpha is roll, beta is pitch, gamma is yaw, so that uh, becomes, the notation becomes compact. So and we call this combination of x, y, z, alpha, beta, gamma as x, i and this leg length as L i, right. So we have to go from the quote unquote the platform to the leg length and then from the leg length to the platform and this is just a definition of roll pitch and yaw. Okay, so it is not a, big deal. <coughs> so now, so we talked about a simple procedure to do the inverse kinematics, right. So you define C alpha cos, uh, C alpha S alpha, C beta, S beta, C gamma, S gamma. Then, so, so this term now, what I had explained earlier is a very generalized formulation. Now, if you remember the notation that we had, we were indicating the position of the ith leg in the platform coordinate using Pix, Piy and Piz, okay. Now, these are multiplied by this product of these angles. So, this is like multiplying with the transformation matrix with that and you get and then to that I add x which is the x translation of the platform right and I subtract the x value of the base. So essentially I get what is the x extent of each leg in the base coordinate system. Similarly I get the y extent of each leg in the base coordinate system and the z extent and then simply take square root and you get the leg length. Okay, so you, you don't necessarily and this is a very general formulation, I have just taken roll pitch here okay, in a very general the, in the Euler format, Euler 1 format and you go through with it. So it is not a vague matrix anymore, you can actually write it out in long form like this. You can calculate the leg lengths pretty simply and you can, this you can see is not very bad, you can just program it in Excel or MATLAB you can get the leg lengths quite effortlessly. Kinematics is a problem. Okay. Is it done to you? You can do it. So, what to do is we change the desired force from on as the initial get vector. And we calculate the vector Li using inverse transformations, okay. Following that, we calculate the vector of errors delta i of the leg length. So what is the problem now? What we are saying is that I know the leg lengths and I want to find the end effect of pose. So I assume a end effect of pose that this is the pose, then I can compute what is the leg length by using this page, okay. Now I have a real set of values for the leg lengths, so not clear. So, uh, I don't know why the direct line is for this. Why? Which is more difficult, integration or differentiation? Why? Right, they are inverse operations, right. So some things are difficult. I mean mathematically, but primary the difficulty also is with multiple solutions. So there is there, a hassle there also. And uh, so that is a very philosophical question as to why is uh, this thing more difficult than that and uh, right. 
So, for example, if I give you a quadratic equation, right, with parameters a x squared plus b x plus c is equal to 0, you know what the roots are, right? You can write in terms of a, b, c, right? If I give you a cubic equation, can you write the solution in terms of a, b, c? Yes, no? Yes? If I give you a fourth order equation? Yes? Huh? Highly difficult. Fifth? Huh? No, why? Huh? You don't know if it is possible, but do you know if it is impossible? Huh? Yeah, so there is this, uh, I think it was Abel, okay, who first proved that it is not possible to write the solution of a fifth order polynomial in closed form. Okay, so human beings found this out roughly around about 1850, if I remember, or maybe even later, 1860. Okay, so it's a. Um, so you can prove that it is not possible to find the solution. So this is also possible, right? So, so it's math is funny. So one way it's easy, one way it's difficult. But it is possible, right? It is not that we will do it. Also, it's difficult. That's why we will do it. The we will see how it is done. Okay, so this is how it goes. Now, <clears throat> to come back here, so I started the problem by saying I know the leg length, so I am trying to solve this problem now. So I know the leg length, I want to know what this is, okay. I know this and I am trying to find out what these parameters are. So I start by assuming something, I calculate the leg length, I have error because that will obviously not be the same as, because I assume the initial position, that will not be the same as the leg length which I actually have. How do I know the leg length? Because I have the Renishaw encoder or equivalent sitting on the leg. So I have error. Then I calculate the Jacobian. I can do it the hard way. What is the hard way? I have this expression, so I can write. del Li upon d alpha. Similarly, I can write del Li upon del x, del y. So, I will get a nasty term, but I can still find the Jacobian. I can compute it numerically. Or I can do it the more elegant way in which, right, the screw approach, which I discussed in the last class which I will show you how to program in Excel, okay, in the next class. Then you invert the Jacobian and you just compute the next, uh, the present, your assumed value of Xi from that you just remove, subtract Jacobian inverse delta I and you have a new update for Xi. You go to step 2 until your error becomes smaller than whatever bound you set. Okay, it's clear, reasonably clear. Okay. So now <coughs> we get to the problem. Why is the uh, inverse kinema, uh, Why is the direct kinematics difficult? Now before we do that, we are going to get into one of the. I mean, just a little bit of maths. Okay, which you. Uh, well, you could have learned that uh, in class, uh, maybe class 10, okay, but you did not. Okay. Not that you should have learned it, I mean, it's not in the curriculum, but it's very interesting. So, there's this concept called the Sylvester matrix, 
and you, so you make a matrix from the coefficients of polynomials so if not one but two polynomials you take two polynomials and <coughs> so the matrix once you form it i'll show you how to form the matrix it gives you some information about the commonality of the polynomials so are two polynomials alike right so is this shirt same as his shirt and so no perhaps you know there is a green color there is a green color right so he says this shirt same as his he says yeah this stripes on this is also has similar stripes on it so this matrix is something very similar it gives you quite a bit of information about similarity of two polynomials okay um, so now to look at it formally if you have two polynomials p and q in this form p0 right so of degree m okay so you will have p0 to pm so m plus 1 coefficients this is of degree n so you will have n plus 1 coefficients so you form a matrix which is n plus m into n plus m matrix very large matrix and so interesting is this polynomial has to be of at least order 0 so this so that tells you what happens so this is always sufficient to put in all the parameters okay so this is how you form the matrix take the first row so what am i trying to do now i'm trying to solve his problem right direct kinematics so you take the first row and you just stack them right so i'll take example of m is equal to 4 n is equal to 3 so p4 p3 p2 p1 p0 and then 0 0 next one i just shift this put a zero here and shift this to the right put two zeros here shift this to the right until i hit the end of it then i write the q's so this and the zeros and then keep shifting and write so essentially the larger of the two polynomials they will occupy larger width in this direction so they can be shifted less so they occupy less number of rows and the smaller occupies more rows but has uh, more gaps on more zeros on both sides okay so you form this now the primary interest that we have is to know that if two polynomials have a common factor okay so i am not asking what is the common factor i am asking do two polynomials have a common factor right because the polynomial factorization problem is is a hard problem right but all we are asking is do they have a common factor so then the you can simply take the coefficients form the sylvester matrix and if they have a common factor then the determinant of that goes to zero right so it's brilliant because to find the determinant is not very difficult right of a matrix and then there are if you look at the matrix there are a whole bunch of zeros so you are guaranteed to have at the most you know you have a p here p here so that immediately tell you that it is very simple because once you take this then you have this term so you'll knock out this so you'll knock out this so then you come here so you'll have two terms here you knock out this knock out this so it is not very difficult to find the determinant of the sylvester matrix if you program it nicely and more importantly converse is also true so the, if the determinant is not zero, is not zero then there is no common factor and so we will need this concept to basically find uh, the solution and consequently the number of solutions to the direct kinematics of what is called the 3 by 3 3 3 parallel manipulator okay 
So, <coughs> what is the 3 3 parameter? So, they have people have come out with a nomenclature, a definition of the 3 3 manipulator. So, what you have here is there are three connection points on the top, there are three at the bottom, and these are so there is a point here from here it goes to two points on the top, and from a point on the top it goes to two points in the bottom. So, this is called the 3 3 manipulator, and you can show that this is a fairly general manipulator, and the platform on top retains the 6 degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, this has an interesting reduction in the solution. So, <coughs> we will take a triangle ABC, which is the problem in solving the direct kinematics problem. So, I know this link length AC and I know BC, and the length AB is invariant. So, A AC and BC will change as I change the actuator. Okay. So, when I change the actuator lens, I will change two sides of this triangle. Okay. But, I know the triangle exactly, I know all the lengths of the triangle. So, I can drop this perpendicular from C onto D, okay, onto the perpendicular onto AB, I can calculate the length CD, I can calculate the location of D on AB also. So, there is no problem. Okay. Now, comes the most interesting part. If I have this triangle sitting there, so if I have just actuator and there is a universal joint here and a universal joint on top, then this point on the top can move on a circle, on a circle on a segment of a sphere, right. So, that is a very large set, it can move over, right. But moment I know that there is this triangle which is there, which I know, and I know that this AB is invariant, then if I have a triangle like this, then it can only move in a, in a circle, which is orthogonal to, which is, uh, to which the line AB is perpendicular. You can find the length of the circle also. So, length is CD, I mean the radius of the circle is CD. So, I know much, I have the path of C is significantly more constrained. Okay. So, what is my only variable? So, I just have to know what is the angle made by this line CD about this axis going through AB. Right? And I can measure it from anywhere, but typically if I have three points at the base, then these three define a plane. Right, any three points in space define a plane. Okay, so I automatically have a plane to measure it from. So everything is falls into place nicely, and after this, I have to do only geometry. So clear? This essential reduction that I'm using a triangle to reduce a path which is a sphere in space to a circle in space, whose Earlier I had a sphere in space whose radius I knew, now it becomes a circle in space whose radius I know. Simpler problem, so here is notation. So, I have this axis W1 which will run along the line AB and I want to measure this angle rho 1 2 and sorry uh, P 1 2. I know this R1 because that is the length CD in the previous case. And similarly for at 3 points I have this, then I am calling these 3 sides 1, 3, 3, 5 and 1, 5. Okay. And these points P5, P1 and P3. Okay. So, the, there is just a little bit of you know convention about this, why it has come down to this. But basically, I had uh, because this originally degenerated from the 6 on top and 6 on the bottom to this 3 3 configuration. So, you can adopt this nomenclature. So, what we are saying is that uh, this 
distance between P1 and P3 is L13, P1 and P5 is L15, and P3, P5, distance between them minus L35 or is equal to L35, right? So essentially, we know these lengths, R3, right? So I write this, what I'm essentially going to do is start from here, I write Q3, so R3 times, times this angle, I can define P3, so then I'll say P1, vector P1 minus vector P3, norm of that has to be equal to L13. Similarly, P3 minus P5 normal has to be L35 and this minus this has to be L15. They are not known yet. So what I will do is I will just expand this. So I just write it in this form, P12, P34, so you can write it as it is expanded into this form in terms of the, now these are the variables I am looking for. P1, 2, P3, 4, which define the, how much the triangle is moving about the base. So, so I have three triangles. So those are the variables which I need to solve for. So I am only three variables which I am solving for now. So then I know the rest, right? Now, you have a larger degree of freedom for the system because the leg lengths can change, the triangle can change, but that's a parameter which I am already computing a priori. So I am not dealing with six degrees of freedom anymore. Once I have computed the length of the length of CD, yeah. So that's available to me already. So I've already solved a part of the equation. Now I'm solving only the other three parts of it. So the next equation and the next equation. So then you use the half angle formulas right and so you can write this essentially as a set of equations in this form so t56 squared and then a b times t56 squared plus c is equal to 0 and then in this polynomial form okay now you can already see how i'm going to use a sylvester matrix right because now if i look at this equation and I look at this equation, a solution to this, two equations, a solution to this equation is T56, right? So one of the factor will be T56 minus something is equal to 0, right? So when I solve it, I will factorize this into two parts and I know that the value of T56 from these two equations must be equal to, must be the same, at least one value. So essentially, if I form the Sylvester matrix using this, then the determinant will be equal to 0, right? So what that will give me, for the determinant to be equal to 0, it will give me a polynomial in A, B, C and R, S, T, where I have accumulated the coefficients. So I generate this, I keep marching forward, I keep marching forward until I so now I'm eliminating T56 from the equation because A, B, C, R, S, T do not contain T56. So I've eliminated that. So it does not contain T56, then will not contain uh, uh, P56. So I will, I'll be left with only equations in T34 and T12. I'll do this again, I'll do this again. I'll do a Sylvester matrix once more and I'll finally land up with the equation in No, so I'll do it once more and I'll eliminate T34, finally I'll solve for, I'll get a polynomial equation in T12 which I have to solve for, okay? Now, I just want to stop here, okay? And I want you people to go back, right? And look up the Sylvester matrix, right? And just verify. And just verify for yourself, take two polynomials, you can easily factor, factor, factorize it and find out what the coefficients are, right? U using the symbolic form in MATLAB, put it into a determinant, form the Sylvester matrix, 
right? And just come back and tell me on Friday whether it worked or not. Just change the coefficients a bit, recompute the determinant, see whether it works out, so that you are convinced as to how this works. Okay. How many will do it? Hmm? Please try it, okay? It's almost magical. Right? So please try it so that uh, you get a understanding of yeah. So after I get these two equations four point two two and four point two three. Yeah. I put these in the Sylvester matrix and T five six T five six gets eliminated. Eliminated. So after that I'll do this once more, I'll eliminate T three four. Once more means how? Well, explain that on Friday. I just want to stop here because I'm just getting you to the point where I've introduced the Sylvester matrix and I'm just showing you how T56 gets eliminated. Right? I don't want to proceed at because this is completely a new concept. Right? So just let it set in. We'll talk about it again. I mean, it's very similar. So I'll do something, manipulate a little bit more, separate out the variables so that I eliminate one more. So finally, I land up with a polynomial in T12. Now, remember this, that using the Sylvester matrix, I cannot find the roots, right? I cannot find the roots. But what I'll do is I'll form a polynomial so I know how many roots will be there. If I know that it's a second order polynomial, then I have two roots, third order polynomial are three roots. So I know how many solutions are possible, maximum. Some of them will be imaginary, but that's okay. But I know how many are there. And actually, it is not so difficult to find the roots of a polynomial, right? Do you know anything about polynomial roots, properties? So some more questions to find out. If I give you a polynomial equation, if I give you a polynomial, a set of coefficients, then if I tell you, okay, can you tell me how many solutions lie between minus 2 and plus 2? Huh? We can't tell that. You? We can't tell that. You can't. We can. You can. How? Yes. So th there is another interesting method. So if you can give me a bound, so it is possible to quickly calculate how many solutions are there in between. Right? So you know how many are outside because you know the total number of solutions. Right? So what you can then do is you can kind of increase your bound, right? So then you know, okay, there is only one solution outside or you can either decrease the band. So then you know there's one solution inside. Subsequently reduce it. If you know there's one solution inside, then it's very easy. Neutral. Then you can Newton Raphson it. But if you're sitting in the middle of many minimas, then you can't find the solutions. Which? It is equivalent to that of plotting the graph of a solution, but it's not exactly the same. There's a numerical procedure in which if you have the polynomial coefficient and you give two bounds, you can immediately say how many solutions lie there, lie in between. It's not the same as, well, the newton raphson is almost the same as plotting the graph, except that you don't enumerate all the points, only selected points. So, so polynomials are magnificent things, right? And people spend roughly uh, 50 years hacking polynomials to death in between 1800 to 1850. Okay, so there's magnificent results, including uh, this one. Uh, but there are many other, there are orthogonal polynomials and you can form polynomial from fields and then you can form orthogonal polynomials and their combinations have magnificent properties also. So, so I'll just end today's lecture with one thing, right? In the Indian engineering colleges, we teach very little mathematics. Right? You do very little mathematics because you do mathematics in your first year, which is essentially differential calculus and some field theory. And then you don't do anymore. So essentially, your mathematics stops at roughly at 1800s. Right? After that, I mean, the whole of uh, field theory and uh, field ring groups which essentially from which is many of the magnificent results are available is something which you do not do. 
and I mean that that's also a big problem because you know it's these are the difficult problems in life. So being able to say that you know solving for this, going back to these methods and say okay, there are exactly so many so many polynomials, and there are many such other interesting problems which are tractable using two hundred year old mathematics, which you need to learn, and it's interesting. It's more challenging, you know. Such a simple thing. Polynomial I've known so many years, right? I just post this question: Can you tell me if these two polynomials have a common factor? You want to start factorizing it, and if you are smart, you'll say that no, factoring polynomials is a very, very difficult problem unless it's quadratic. Even cubic fourth order is possible. Anything after that is impossible. So we will see. I mean, part of doing robotics is that you have to know. Significantly more mathematics than uh, you can otherwise get out of programming. Okay, so we'll continue with this.